So here in Module 5, we're going to be talking about various ways in which the historical record can be used in the cognitive science of religion. As I mentioned in the intro, there's a, a couple reasons why this is important. We have this in experimental work, experimental social psychology, for instance, this problem with the weird sample that most of our work, 90-something percent of the, the research published, is on North American university undergraduates. We have to get beyond this very narrow, unrepresentative sample. And the way this is typically done is in expanding our sample, contemporary samples, and moving beyond university students and actually getting real adults in the community, or going to other societies, going to different cultures, ideally cultures with very different modes of subsistence, so hunter-gatherers, people with very different lifestyles, so you actually get the full spectrum of human diversity in a contemporary sample. The other way to get some more diversity, though, is to go back go back in time, so go into the historical record and try to get senses of past cognition by looking at the traces of human minds in texts, in archaeological artifacts. One way to look at the past is it contains these traces of people's thoughts. So the historian Luther Martin has called this data from dead minds, the, the traces of past minds. Now, unfortunately, we can't manipulate dead people the way we can contemporary people in experiments. We can't do experimental manipulations, we can't have control groups, and that, that limits some things we can know. But it's amazing how much we can know about both implicit and explicit cognition from looking at, at archaeological records or texts. So it's not just the case that we can find out what people said explicitly. We obviously have that in texts. But by reading between the lines is one of the things that humanists do, is reading between the lines to see what the underlying cognitive assumptions are that are producing these explicit statements. So we actually can get at both implicit and explicit cognition by looking at texts. If we want to think about the intersection of cognitive science of religion and history, there's at least two ways in which this can happen. One is using theories coming out of the cognitive sciences, particularly the cognitive science of religion, to look at ancient texts. So interpreting ancient texts through the lens of our knowledge about human cognition that we have now. That's one way. The second way these can intersect is using historical records as data to test theories in the cognitive science of religion. So testing them not just against contemporary experimental subjects, but against the historical record. So we'll talk a little bit in general about how both of these approaches work. Perhaps the most common way in which theories from the cognitive sciences are being applied to historical materials is the application of cognitive linguistics to historical texts. So cognitive linguistics is a field of linguistics that looks at the way in which human cognition is shaping language use. This approach is probably best known to the general public through the work of Lakoff and Johnson, so George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who came up with this idea of conceptual metaphor theory. So in conceptual metaphor theory, their argument is that metaphor is not just a turn of phrase, it's not just something we use to dress up a sentence that could be said the same way literally. Their argument is that essentially we think in metaphor, so human beings actually draw upon our sensory motor experience, our embodied experience of walking down paths or handling objects or dealing with containers. And we use this kind of implicit knowledge, the implicit logic that we get from our embodied beings inhabiting an embodied world. We draw upon that to reason and make inferences about the abstract world. So when we're dealing with something we can't get a direct grip on, we often use a metaphor. And again, the metaphor is not just a linguistic turn of phrase. We're actually thinking in the metaphors. So and when we talk about, I have a difficult decision and I talk about coming to a crossroads, we're really thinking in terms of the logic of a crossroads. If I take this fork, I can't take that one. The logic of walking down paths is informing the way we think about something abstract. If I think about someone's wasting my time, I really have a visceral feel of time as a kind of resource that's being taken away from me or drained from me. So it's very powerful and there's very good evidence that it's true, that this is in fact the case that human beings don't think in abstract, completely abstract terms. We're often thinking in these very real lived metaphors. Metaphors we live by is one of their best known titles. So the application of Lakoff and Johnson style conceptual metaphor theory to religion religious texts, early religious texts, has, has a long history. So people in my particular field, Chinese thought, um, it started with people like Sarah Allen, who were using metaphor theory to analyze things like water and early Chinese mythology and texts. It had a huge impact on my work. So I had a problem, I wrote a dissertation about this concept of wu wei, or effortless action, in early Chinese thought. It literally means non-doing. And one of my arguments was that you see this ideal in many texts in early China, even texts that we don't tend to associate historically with Wu Wei, and even in texts that don't use the term at all. So they don't anywhere in the text use the term Wu Wei, but I'm arguing the concept is there. 
at the time, armed with just the tools of kind of traditional intellectual history, I had no rigorous way to demonstrate that. Essentially, all I could do is put these stories from these texts next to each other and go. <laughs> Don't they look alike? They kind of seem alike. Um, I had no rigorous way of identifying whether or not a story was about Wu Wei or not. I wasn't fully satisfied with the solution, but I wasn't really sure what to do about it. And I took my first job at the University of Colorado, and a student at one of my graduate seminars one day handed me this book and said, I think you'd like this book. And it was Philosophy in the Flesh, Lake Off and Johnson's Philosophy in the Flesh. And it literally was an enlightenment experience or a conversion experience. It solved a lot of problems for me. It really transformed the way I looked at the way we would analyze text. But importantly for Wu Wei, what it made me realize is that this no doing is actually just the most general metaphor. Because it's not about doing nothing. You're often doing a lot of things. You just have a sense of not exerting effort. It's a metaphor where the subject, the locus of consciousness, feels like it's not doing anything. Because the world is carrying you along, or some other part of you is carrying you along. And I realized that Uwe itself was a metaphor, and actually just the most general metaphor of a family of metaphors that was fairly discreet. There are about 20 of them. So they pervade these stories that seem to me intuitively to be about Wu Wei. So it actually gave me a rigorous way to talk about how these stories are connected. They all contain the small set of metaphors that convey the sense of effortlessness or unselfconsciousness. So it's a very powerful technique for me for, for understanding how these stories fit together. And I went on to argue in religious studies that conceptual metaphor theory can be a way to do comparative work. It actually gives us a way to talk about how texts from very different cultures can be understood. As a modern American, I can understand a classical Chinese text. That's puzzling, right? Classical Chinese is a very different language. These texts were written 4th century BCE. How can I know that I'm understanding them? I'm arguing one of the ways conceptual metaphor theory allows us to think about this is I can understand them because I'm using my body as a decoder key. We want to think of it that way. So when the text is using a metaphor of a container or a path, I know that I know what that means because I've walked down paths and I've used containers with my body. So this embodied experience manifested in conceptual metaphors gives us a path, a kind of way to get into the minds of other people. So it's a really powerful way to think about how we do comparative religion in the first place and how we analyze religious texts. So this has become a huge subfield really in religious studies. There's been a lot of work, people using conceptual metaphor theory to analyze texts from every imaginable culture. The key feature of all of this work, and this is really the insight that's coming out of cognitive science, out of cognitive linguistics, and helping religious scholars do their work, is that metaphors matter. They're not just rhetoric they actually help you think in a certain way. So for instance, a 2013 piece by Jens Schleider talks about metaphors for karma in Theravada Buddhism and points out that in Western languages, we talk about karma using economic metaphors and bank metaphors, like you have an account of good and bad karma. We think in terms of kind of money and bank accounts. His point is that actually in the, the original text, they're using different metaphors. They're using metaphors like seeds, so seeds that get planted and then fruit into something. So the result is the fruit that comes from the bad seed, let's say, if you have bad karma. And his point is that this matters. If we're actually using a completely different set of metaphors when we're talking about these texts, we're actually missing some of the entailments. Entailments of a seed to a fruit metaphor are very different from a bank account with positive and negative karma in it. Conceptual metaphor theory helps scholars of religion not only access texts, but also understand how confusions can arise in cross-cultural discussions of religious texts. A less common way in which work from the cognitive sciences can impact the way we read religious texts, but one that I'm hoping is going to become more common, is how our understanding, our current best understanding of the human mind can place interpretive limits on us. So when we go into a text, we, we go in assuming that there's kind of certain basic universal structures of human cognition, and that is definitely not the case in the humanities right now. So currently, we tend to approach texts from other cultures assuming that they're radically different. You see a text, a text in classical Chinese, and it seems like it must be a whole different worldview because the language is so different. It's, it, it must be thinking radically different from the way in which we think. But if you change that perspective and you think about the fact that they are, they're homo sapiens. We're homo sapiens. They were homo sapiens. We had the same bodies. We were interacting with a very similar physical world. And we also had very similar cognitive structures because we had essentially the same genetic makeup. If you start from the assumption of embodied commonality, you really have a completely different interpretive starting point point 
And your interpretive starting point often determines where you end up. <laughs> Texts are hard to interpret. So one example of this you may remember from Module 1, Lecture 5, when I talked about mind-body dualism in early China. So this claim that the early Chinese were mind-body holists, and how taking seriously work on theory of mind and folk dualism makes that highly unlikely. It changes the balance of proof. And so if we really take this work seriously, when we go into a text, our interpretive starting point is different. The interpretive starting point is that human beings seem to be mind-body, messy dualists or loose dualists. So they're not Cartesians, but mind and body seem different. And that then really is going to systematically change the way we read the text. So there are many ways in which our cognitive science, both in terms of particular theories about how language works, about how language interacts with the mind and, and conveys embodied experience, or what the embodied commonalities are that human beings have, really change the way humanities scholars, scholars of religion, do their work. The second way in which cognitive science of religion and history can intersect is using historical data to test out or evaluate hypotheses in the cognitive science of religion. So probably the earliest work in this regard was done with regard to Harvey Whitehouse's modes theory of ritual. So we've talked about this idea that ritual comes in two basic modes, this the imagistic mode and the doctrinal mode. And this makes predictions about the historical record. It makes predictions about what we should see if we can get traces or have some understanding of how ritual was done in past cultures, it should fit the pattern that's predicted by White House's theory. So a 2004 volume edited by White House and Luther Martin collected essays from historians and archaeologists where they're taking the predictions of the modes theory and putting it next to their data, looking at their archaeological record or textual record and seeing if the predictions made by the theory match what they see in their historical materials. And in some cases, it fit fairly well, and in other cases, the historians are arguing it doesn't work very well at all. What they sometimes see is a mixed mode. One particularly interesting test of the modes theory against the historical record is a piece by Katrinka Reinhardt in 2015, where she's looking at early Chinese materials, so Neolithic and Bronze Age China. And what's interesting is, first of all, very bloody practices going on. So the Neolithic peoples and up through the early Bronze Age cultures engage in massive amounts of human sacrifice, so sacrificing servants, wives, and concubines, children sometimes, certainly war captives, animals. They kill horses in their chariot harnesses. <laughs> There's a lot of blood involved in these burial practices and various types of divination practices. So Dr. Reinhardt looks at the historical record and her argument is that as we move from the Neolithic into the early Bronze Age, we're moving from smaller scale, more dispersed societies into essentially a centralized bureaucratic state. So we, we have this bureaucracy by the time we get to the Shang. And she argues that modes theory would predict a decrease in the amount of violence. So if you recall, the modes theory predicts that the imagistic mode is used to tie people together in a very intense way, create this kind of identity fusion through dysphoria, pain, and also pageantry, and a lot of things like cutting people's heads off and putting them in a tomb, as opposed to the doctrinal mode with repeated, very common rituals. They're going to be low affect. They're going to be uh, low emotion, low pageantry, more doctrine being presented. Doctrinal modes involved in centralized states. So he associates doctrinal mode with centralized states that have a bureaucracy and are trying to unify religious practice across a large geographical area, which is what we have by the time we have the Shang Dynasty. We have rulers who are ruling a fairly large area. And Reinhardt finds that what you see in the archaeological record is in fact no fall off in the amount of sacrifices and bloodiness and pageantry. If anything, there's an increase. The Shang, as they get bigger, can just kill more people and create bigger, more gruesome tombs. So in this regard, at least, the modes theory does not seem to fit the archaeological record from early China. And again, this reminds us of the science part of the cognitive science of religion, that we're actually not putting out these theories that are untestable. We're putting out theories that make predictions. And one of the goals is to test them against the data. And if they're not looking pretty good, we're going to revise them. And so that's ideally what's going to happen with these big theories about ritual in the field, is that as they get tested against historical data, they'll have to be revised or maybe even discarded.
Another representative study produced in 2014 by one of our postdocs at Simon Fraser University, Jessica Munson and colleagues, used a hieroglyph database of Mayan hieroglyphs. So we have this essentially textual database of these Mayan hieroglyphs, combining it with an archaeological record where we have records of where these particular bloodletting instruments were found. So the Mayans were famously bloodthirsty and also not that reluctant to spill their own blood. So there are various ceremonies where the king people doing these rituals would let their own blood using these very gruesome implements. And, so, and we find these implements in various archaeological sites. So one of the things this team did was look at the overlay of where these instruments were found and using those as a proxy of where and when bloodletting was being practiced and what we're finding in the textual record. One of the assumptions in the field was that this was a widespread practice, that Mayans were practicing bloodletting everywhere. But this doesn't seem to be the case. These, the archaeological findings are clustered. We only find these bloodletting instruments in particular places. And the finding seems to be that, first of all, these are sites that are connected by ties of affiliation. So these sites seem to be interacting with one another. And they also seem to co-occur with expressions of antagonism to outside groups, references to warfare and various types of conflict. So there seems to be a co-location, if you want to think of it this way, of these bloodletting instruments and signs of strife or warfare. And the team sees this as, as possible confirmation of costly signaling theories about things like bloodletting rituals. So bloodletting is a very dramatic thing, particularly the way the Mayans performed it. It was not something you would do lightly. The argument coming out of cognitive science of religion that is relevant is that these kind of very extreme rituals, extreme acts of self-harm or self-sacrifice, are going to be used as a coalition binding uh, practice. And you're going to want to, you're going to tend to want to do that more when you're facing opposition when you're facing warfare or other types of conflict. And this seems to be what we're seeing in the Mayan historical records. So it's a good combination of archaeology and textual records to test out a theory like costly signaling theory against historical materials. It'd be useful at this point to make an observation that's actually applicable to the whole of this course. So we're giving you examples that come to mind and that are relatively recent as we make this MOOC in 2016. These will be out of date soon. So one thing we're going to be doing is updating our additional reading list on the site so you can see what's come out since, the, since this MOOC was made. But if you're interested in this uh, general approaches, so general ways in which history can be used in the cognitive science of religion, there are the journals I'd steer you to are the Journal of Cognitive Historiography. So this is a relatively new journal that's explicitly about applying cognitive methods to the study of history and often to religious texts. We also have at the American Academy of Religion, the Cognitive Science of Religion group now. So this is a group that I started with Ann Taves back in 2008. So we're now actually quite a large group. The Society for Biblical Literature also has several groups that are explicitly interested in cognitive approaches to the religious record. Perhaps one of the most exciting techniques for bringing CSR into dialogue with history are techniques coming out of the digital humanities. So specifically, large-scale textual analysis, so new methods for analyzing massive amounts of text, so huge amounts of historical text, and also the use of large-scale databases, so taking religious beliefs and practices and encoding them in large-scale databases that then can be analyzed. So these are the two approaches that we're going to be looking at in the next two lectures.